Long Voyage presents Guinevere of Camelot, based on Monterey's Mont d'Artour. Your host is Miller Cradleville. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring to you at this time the first of a new series of Long Voyage programs called Guinevere of Camelot. We go back through the centuries to the mist-enshrouded realm of King Arthur and his famous Knights of the Round Table. Now, for our purposes on this series, we have chosen to center our story around Guinevere, who was the wife of Arthur and Queen of the Realm. Guinevere, according to legend, was gracious, charming, every inch a queen, but she was also a woman who had emotions that she could not always hold in check, and she lost her heart to Lancelot. Lancelot was the most daring and gallant of all of Arthur's knights. Around this tragic love story of Lancelot and Guinevere, uh, an affair, by the way, which indirectly brought about the ruination of Arthur's kingdom, we have woven our episodes for this particular series. So let us turn now to our first dramatic reading of Guinevere of Camelot. It befell in the days of Uther Pendragon, when he was king of all England and so reigned, that there was a mighty duke in Cornwall that held war against him long time. And this duke had to him a wife, a fair lady in passing wise called Igraine. Now Uther desired to have Lady Igraine for his queen, whereto I, the sage Merlin, did lend him both aid and advice. The fee for my service was Arthur, the son of Igraine and King Uther, whom I received as a babe. Under my guidance, he grew to be a knight, was crowned a king when Uther died, and proved a worthy leader in the many wars that jealous rivals, eager for his throne, did thrust upon him. One day it befell that Arthur came to me, as was his wont, with matters close to both his heart and crown. Merlin, the time has come that I should wed. How is this so, my king? The barons urge that I must have a wife, a worthy queen. They press me strongly, and I must needs yield. <laughs> come, Arthur, you should not pretend with me. Remember, sire, I caused you to be crowned. If I mistake me not, there's two fair eyes, one set of smiling lips, a pair of arms, indeed a lengthy list of graces here to bend your mind to marry. Tell me, King, whom you desire. What lady do you long for? If I may, I'll help you to her hand. Then think you back to King Leodegrance, whose lands I freed from turmoil some time past when he was sore beset. We but rode past his castle, yet I glimpsed therein a maid, his daughter, I was told, who caught my heart as if it were a glove I'd thrown down and wears it now, although she knows it not. Know you her name? I never heard it spoke. Tis Guinevere. As beautiful as she is, Guinevere. And truly she's your love. This is not well. Not well? She has a husband then, perhaps? She's free, and I misdoubt not you could have her hand, for King Leodegrant, you know, is in your debt. Then why is this not well? Evil will come of such a match, I know. She has your heart, but you do not have hers. And if you wed her and she loves elsewhere, your kingdom may be lost. For if the king and queen do not accord, how shall their knights follow the fair example they should set and live in love and fight in honor's cause? Know you of this, or do you much distrust? Has my advice proved false to you ere this? No, Merlin, it has not. Then trust me here. I'll find for you a damsel like to none in beauty, pleasant wit, and faithful heart. Not so. If I may not have Guinevere, I'll reign alone and have no wife at all. Nay, Arthur, you must wed. Your knights urge well, and true it is the kingdom wants a queen. But Guinevere is not the one to choose. My heart has made my choice. I cannot gainsay it. And there's further reason, too, which pleads her cause full urgently to me. 
My father, Euthyphen Dragon, did hold a wondrous table, which upon his death passed to King Leodegrance, the father of the maid I love. This magic board, the table round, perchance would come to me as dower gift, and I much covet it. Mm. Here is a matter worthy of concern. Indeed, the table round would be again most welcome to your realm, for it is said the noblest knights in all of Christendom would gather round it. Is this not enough to grant me Guinevere? For by my life I must confess my longing for the maid is nearly equaled and is much enhanced by my desire to have the table round. Arthur, I yield. This is most wisely urged, and I would sooner try to hold the tides from swelling with the moon than change your heart if it is truly lodged with Guinevere. Then I shall go to seek her hand in haste. <laughs> Move softly, Arthur. It is many days to reach her kingdom, and you've matters here that do demand your presence. Tell me then what man to send as my ambassador. I myself shall go. And will you seek as dowry the round table? Be assured I'll serve your interests well in all respects. Go then, take horse and ride before the sun is set. I'm eager for my love. I know, but patience. And before the moon comes full, we'll have a wedding. I and crown you both in ceremony suited to the cause. Merlin set out and came in good time to the castle of Leodegrance who received him in full honor, much pleased that Arthur should seek his daughter's hand. The round table as well was gladly given, and all was settled soon between Merlin and Leodegrance. Before setting out for Camelot, however, Merlin deemed it wise to have some words with Guinevere. My Lady Guinevere, I give you greeting from King Arthur who commanded me to speak you fair, for he did much regret that he might not himself seek out your hand. I cannot take it ill, for customs foresee such that marriage contracts are arranged by kings and not by maidens. This is true. Yet I would sound out your heart. My heart? Pray, sire, what has my heart to do with marrying a man whom I have ne'er set eyes upon? He has seen you, although you marked him not. When he rode past your tower, he lost his heart to your fair eyes. This is most flattering. Yet can a man whose love is lightly lost on but a glance wish so to bind himself? He can, fair lady, and so he does, or else I had not come so far to plead his cause. But tell me, are you minded to be queen, or do you but accept your father's wish? What choice have I? A maiden gives her hand where she is bid, or loses her estate and all her future, cast off and disowned. You do not give me answers. I have come to study out the courses of your heart. Now tell me truly, can you love the king? I'll tell you what I can. And if I fail to please you, Merlin, you must be content. For I shall not dissent. That is fair. My heart's a bird, new-fledged and flying free. And of its own it has no nesting place. Nor is it finger tame, it tries its wings to please itself, and not at my command. If it may choose to light upon the branch called Arthur, and there build its nest and home, then all is well. But if it does not choose, and like the phoenix never leaves the air, so be it. And the final loss is mine. Or if, despite my bidding, it will rest upon some lesser limb, then all the nets in Christendom will not ensnare its wings. This I can promise, only this, no more. And it must be enough. I have your word, however, that you'll try to call it home and keep it gently caged if it should scorn its proper place. Nay, Merlin, it would die if I should clip its wings. I can but say that if the king is fair and kind to me and courteous, I'll try to be a queen with all his good regard. Indeed, the course my true love runs may well be in his hands, for I have not been wooed before this time by any other man. So Arthur has the surest chance to win your winged heart. He does, and it is in my power to pray that he'll succeed, for I'm to be a queen, it seems, whether I will or no. You are? Does this displease you? Merlin, to be crowned, admired, given honors and respect, would be a joy to any woman's heart, and so much more to mine. 
for I have spent too many years secluded, cloistered here in this remotest corner of the land. Tis well. Yet I must warn you that a crown is envied just as often as admired, that honors are received as they are given, and that true respect must needs be earned. But as we ride to Camelot, I'll try to teach you how you best may fill the role. Pray do, for I have need of much advice. Now, Merlin, I believe I've answered you full fairly, never lying to ensure your good regard. Will you then answer me one question which has plagued my mind since you and Father settled on my future fate? You have been honest, Guinevere, and I admire you for it. Ask me and I shall reply. I know my father gives as dower right the table round which he from Arthur's sire received in trust upon King Uther's death. How much of Arthur's longing for my hand was moved by longing for this noble gift? <laughs> I knew you fair from Arthur's moonstruck gaze. I found you honest, Guinevere, and now I see that you are clever and shrewd. Then I have struck the heart of his desire with my first bolt. Not quite. Though it is true that Arthur coveted the table round. He might have had it by some other means, for King Leodegrance lies in his debt. Still, Merlin, have I missed the mark by far. No, Guinevere. If I said otherwise, it would be a falsehood. But you must not think the king holds you in less regard for this. He lost his heart before he knew your name, and would have loved had you been but a wench in service. That your father as a king makes marriage in all honor possible and that he gives you uh, to wife a gift most right and worthy for the court you rule, makes this his union so much more to be sought and commended. Let me be more plain. If I set out to buy a horse for war, and find one strong and eager and well-schooled, and if he perchance is colored well to boot, you cannot say that I bought him for his coat, however much I pride me in its hue. And likewise, Arthur asked your hand for love. And if you come rich dowry, did as well by that much more, but not the deepest cause that moves him to his choice. Your words are fair, but are they only yours? Do you defend your king so wisely, but to serve his cause, to bring an eager bride back to his arms? Beware, wise Merlin, lest you lead my thoughts to expectation of a paragon. No man is perfect. Arthur, as a king, can scale the heights of glory if God wills. You, his queen, can shed your lovely light upon the path he travels. But take heed you do not fall behind, for then the shade of his own shadow will obscure the way. Nor should you dance ahead, for light can blind and he may stumble on an unseen stone. Stay at his side. Guinevere, perhaps you'll find perfection there. So be it then. I'll go with you to Arthur in full joy, with open heart and mind all bent to serve as best I may. So please you, Guinevere, and if in any wise you seek my aid, I'll give you honest counsel, so you'll be a worthy queen to Arthur, for his reign and yours bodes well to be a brilliant page in England's history. May you speak truth. And now, sire, pardon me, for we ride betimes tomorrow, and there's much to do in preparation for the journey hence. Until tomorrow then, when we'll set out in goodly company for Camelot, your wedding and your crowning. So farewell. Professor M. R. Craddaville of the Department of English and Speech at Iowa State College. Readers Ricky Weiser, Frank Aluso, and Lamar Smith. Viewers who enroll in... And especially welcome this week because our guest has a great deal of responsibility in connection with Religion in Life Week, which begins on Sunday. He has many other responsibilities, but I'd like to have you meet him and have him tell you...